so um just go to so on behalf of everyone at the Centre for Climate Justice, a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us for this, the third of our online public uh, engagements. Now, these public engagements are set up to, um, to uh, for not just uh, academics, but for students and practitioners and anyone who's interested in any of the topics that, that we are discussing. Um, we have participants from uh, different parts of the world. So from wherever you're joining us from, a very good morning, a very good afternoon, or a very good, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am Tissing Jaffrey and I am the director of the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. Our focus is putting front and centre difficult and challenging conversations and research on the impacts of climate change from an injustice uh, perspective. And we provide education on climate justice via our unique master's climate justice program and we are home to a growing cohort of doctoral students as well so again on behalf of everybody at the center a huge welcome uh, to you all so on to um, our event uh, today microfinance and climate change adaptation insights from rural rwanda the presentations today relate to the findings of a project that has just been concluded on the role of microfinance and climate change adaptation. It was conducted in rural Rwanda and particularly in the south and northwest with participants from farmer saving groups and cooperatives. The work was funded by Opportunity International and GCU's Global Challenges Fund. We worked with our project partners and they include the University of Rwanda, Urbego Bank um, and the project team uh, included Karen, Pete and Ella who were all working as a team to um, conduct the, the, the work, collecting, analysing, synthesi synthesising and condensing all the findings into our final report. The field work I may say was conducted by Michael and Clemmy um, and that work was done in July last year, July 19. And a huge thanks to Clemmy in particular because she has a, a, she's very familiar with the Rwandan landscape um, and has uh, conducted uh, work in the work in the, in the country and spent time um, living in Rwanda as well. So her insight into shaping uh, the project was, is, has been hugely uh, invaluable. So just by way of overview, microfinance has the capacity to deliver uh, funding on the ground to reach the poorest and most vulnerable communities. And this I find really interesting because it's an area where not much work has been done uh, and in particular looking at this relationship between climate change adaptation and the contribution that microfinance can play in, in, the, in the adaptation. Uh, but I also recognise there are many tensions um, and differences in opinions about microfinance and the role it can play, which makes this conversation particularly uh, exciting. So our event uh, this afternoon, uh, we will hear from three great speakers. First of all, we'll hear from Karen Helwig, who was the project lead uh, in this case, and she will present findings of evidence from Rwanda, Rwanda and how microfinance enables adaptation referring in particular to gaps and challenges ahead. I, I would like to just add that Karen has just recently taken over as a programme leader uh, for our unique Masters Climate Justice programme. So again, Karen, thanks uh, and welcome for, for taking part in this event. We will then hear from Michael, um, who will provide insights into the social implications of microfinance in terms of social mobility and stratification. Uh, and Michael has been working with me at the centre for quite a few years now as our research fellow and is engaged in a number of different um, portfolios of work, including um, international development and intersectionality. We will then hear from Pete Parisetti on how this project has led to the development of a second new project. So um, welcome, Pete, and thank you for joining us. Um, and giving uh, a sense of where this is going next um, uh, in the future. Um, the presentations will be followed by a question and answer session, and that will be moderated by myself and Clemmy. 
what I would like to say is if you would like to ask a question, please provide it in the chat box, which is the purple thumbnail at the bottom of the screen. And if you could, um, uh, when you're raising your question, if you let us know who that question is directed at, and it will help us to moderate that, that um, question and answer session. And so it flows um, pretty swiftly. So without further ado, I think I would like to now hand over to, uh, sorry, wrong slide, to um, Karen um, for the first of our presentations. So over to you, Karen. Thank you, Hasim. Um, I will um, start with a very short introduction uh, of the vision behind the project. Um, then I'll uh, describe the parts of Rwanda, the districts that we were in, in a little bit more detail. I'll talk about our methods and then I will move on to results, in particular the Rwanda farmers' experience of climate change, their adaptation response and their experience with microfinance uh, in that uh, adaptation response. And then I'll, I'll finish up on some of the uh, gaps and challenges that uh, are remaining. So as Tassin already said, it was um, an interdisciplinary project um, with researchers from two of GCU's research centres, the UNIS Centre and the Centre for Climate Justice, as well as the University of Rwanda, funded by Opportunity International and GCU. And um, the project really sought to, to bring together these two um, concepts of climate justice and microfinance. Uh, so I just want to start with going over those very briefly. Um, climate justice offers an interpretative frame to analyze the inequalities embedded within climate change and our responses to it. And of course the vision for climate justice is that um, our response to climate change should not exacerbate existing inequalities. Um, but it is a con uh, contested um, concept and there's lots of different definitions and, uh, and different perspectives on that. Microfinance then um, has been an area of particular interest um, for um, climate adaptation. It's really not been um, explored all that much, but there is that understanding that microfinance aims to deliver finance on the ground to households um, that are not served by the conventional banking sector, um, that are usually low income disadvantaged households. Um, and international climate finance sometimes fails to reach those uh, people, those, those um, socioeconomically lower um, parts of society. So if we can bring these two concepts together, then that is, is potentially very interesting. Okay. Um, the research questions that we had then was firstly just to find out how does climate variability affect Rwandan farmers' livelihoods? Um, how can microfinance affect their ability to adapt to climate variability? And also um, how climate variability is likely to affect the microfinance institutions in the country. And today um, we'll focus really on one and two. Um, I uh, also wanted to say that because uh, this was part funded by GCU's um, Global Challenges Fund, um, for us there was a real um, uh, really wanted to develop the partnership between GCU and the University of Rwanda. So um, when Michael and Clemmy went out to Rwanda, they also held a workshop at the university to explore that partnership further and see where we could take it next. Okay, just about the background on agriculture in Rwanda. It's economically an important sector. It accounts for about a third of GDP. Uh, it's mostly rain-fed crop production, but um, with some irrigation as well, as we'll see. Um, the farming sector, is there's a lot of poverty there, which limits the adaptation opportunities. Um, and I should point out that um, both cash crops and subsistence crops are grown. Um, the Rwandan government um, sees uh, 
agriculture is very important for uh, development and it has a vision of um, the cooperatives having a central role in that. So many farmers are organized in cooperatives and um, there's a strong focus on crop intensification through the, their crop intensification program. Um, we uh, started with this research and then Michael and Clemmy uh, went to uh, Rwanda uh, for a fortnight last summer in 2019 and conducted 28 interviews um, with mostly loan customers but also some people who were not able to get loans and with Urego Bank staff and a government official. Um, we then analysed the data um, using thematic analysis. So, uh, as Tassin already said, uh, Rubufu is in the northwest of the country and Huya is further south. And um, to describe those in a bit more detail, um, Rubufu um, mainly has potato farmers um, who also grow subsistence crops and uh, pyrethrum, the latter is used for uh, production of a natural pesticide. Um, they are organized in savings groups. They're relatively small, 20 to 30 members, and they get bank, uh, sorry, they get loaned from Orwego Bank to buy seeds and fertilizer. In Huya district, um, there is a rice cooperative, much larger, so more than 250 members, and that is rented from the government, um, whereby the um, rice paddies are irrigated by a dam that was constructed by the government as well. And most farmers there also have um, a hillside plot where they grow their subsistence crops. And those hillside plots are individually owned. And they use Rego Bank uh, mainly to buy fertilizer. So the climate impacts in these two areas were slightly different. Um, in Rubavu, the overall temperature change was not um, uh, very much, uh, if at all. Um, but there was um, increasingly erratic patterns of rainfall. So the rainfall didn't always fall when expected, and it was also heavier. Um, and one of the farmers explained to us that the heavy rainfall renders the Irish potato crop susceptible to pests and diseases, so that it requires spraying pesticides immediately. And that's actually quite an interesting finding straight away. If you read the literature, then in climate, change effects of crops, uh, sorry, on um, uh, pests and diseases. Um, the focus tends to be on the spread of the range of the pests, but that, that kind of interplay between the weakening of the crops due to flooding issues or drought issues, um, that then leads to a vulnerability to pests, um, hasn't been looked at as much yet as far as we can tell. In Huya, um, there is a um, much stronger uh, climate change trend of increasing aridity and uh, people widely remembered droughts in the recent years, um, talked about delayed rainfalls, um, but also again on unusually heavy rain and flooding which caused damage and also caused erosion and landslides both on the hillsides and in the rice paddies. And the losses could be very severe, 50 to 100 percent in some cases. So the impact of that, um, perhaps not surprisingly, is less produce um, from the subsistence crops, and that was a direct impact on food availability for the families, but also less food available on local markets where people tend to sell their, you know, the um, food that they um, aren't selling this. So this, they feed directly into these local markets. So if there's local shortages, um, then that's visible there too. And also it affected people's ability to um, support each other through informal networks. One person said, I can't even give to my neighbor who is in need because it's not even enough for me and I have to be cautious. Um, and in addition to that, they also mentioned it was difficult to provide a balanced diet. It's not just about the amount of food, but also about the quality of the diet. And financially, um, the impact was um, that there was obviously a lack of food, but, but quite wide range of things people mentioned that they'd struggled with, so medical insurance and school fees. Um, they've not been able to go ahead as planned with um, some projects like house building, sometimes found it hard to pay laborers or to pay back their loans. Um, but for the latter, 
Um, they also mentioned that the cooperative provides a financial buffer. So although um, the individual is not able to pay back the loan, the cooperative can then pay back the loan and the individual is indebted to the cooperative via a social loan. So how do the farmers adapt to these changes? Um, for drought, there was, they attempted to irrigate more. Um, they were growing nearer the marshland, if that was possible, and also tried to grow drought tolerant crops and um, use rainwater harvesting. You see uh, one of the plastic rainwater tanks on the image in the photograph there. Um, adaptations to heavy rain included digging contours, so terracing and um, making sure that the irrigation channels were clear, again, growing different varieties and, and also crop rotation. And the, uh, in addition to that, they mentioned just good farm management, planting early, using pesticides and fertilizers and growing food security crops, because they're the crops that perform relatively well uh, under a, a wider range of climate conditions. Um, there were challenges with that. Um, irrigation was in particular difficult and expensive on the hillside plots and uh, poverty also constrained farmers. Um, some mentioned they weren't able to afford the plastic rainwater tanks, for example. And there was also problems with the government infrastructure um, that the dam was reported to be leaking. Um, so as you see, some of these adaptations were supported by funding uh, through Orego Bank's microfinance scheme, in particular the fertilizers, um, but there's quite a lot going on that um, is not particularly in the focus of the microfinance products at the moment. Um, having said that, the farmers had uh, almost unanimously positive experience of microfinance um, and one farmer explained that quite comprehensively, saying these loans from Orego Bank help us to cope with changing weather, because if you apply fertilizers and there's a good rainfall, you get a good yield. And if you are not able to get loans, they will not have such a good yield. But if we apply fertilizers and rainfall is not good enough in the paddies, then we still manage to get some yield. And those who didn't apply any fertilizer will get nothing. So it really is um, getting that slightly higher production, which is seen as reducing vulnerability. Um, in addition to that, the loans also provided general financial leeway. They don't have to spend money on fertilizers, so they can spend it on other things. Um, they appreciated the fact that the loans were in kind and flexible, and in particular, um, the fact that they could pay back um, according to the season. So Urego um, asks for a repayment when, they're, when they have an income from the harvest and that suits them much better than having perhaps monthly repayments. Um, they also refer to the training provided by Orego Bank, that's both good agricultural practice training and financial management training, and generally that was seen as useful too. Um, having said that, nevertheless, um, we still heard people you know, having to dig into their savings to cope with um, impact of climate change, having to rent out their lands or having to start the season working in other people's fields in order to get some investment funds, um, having to take on temporary non-farm employment such as construction uh, activities, um, working on construction sites um, or moving towards off-farm commercial activities and sometimes planning for new livelihoods altogether. And what was also mentioned, although indirectly, is that casual workers um, would have to migrate, um, casual workers migrate to wherever the rain has fallen. Um, and that leads me to some of the remaining gaps and challenges. Um, we've heard the hillside um, Plot adaptations, um, in particular things like you know digging the contours, um, but also being able to apply uh, the fertilizer products or the seeds. Um, that wasn't really something they could apply to the hillside plots because um, the loans go through the cooperative, so they cannot be applied to the individually owned hillside plots. So the subsistence crops are um, like 
sorry, the adaptations were did not work so well for the subsistence crops as they did for the cash crops. And that um, kind of tied in with findings from the literature, in particular, um, this article by Clay and King, 2018, um, that mentioned that the Rwanda's crop intensification program aims to convert largely subsistence based uh, smallholders to professional farmers. So if we see where the microfinance um, is, is targeted at, so that kind of supports that crop intensification uh, program, or at least its aim, that, that goes in the same direction. Um, and therefore, perhaps the impact on the subsistence crops is um, the greatest. Um, they also mentioned they, had, they were interested in um, some additional products. Uh, for example, several mentioned that it would be good to have pesticides as loan products or crop insurance, different type of products, um, and that they would appreciate investment funds for off-farm activities. Um, and then finally, um, perhaps the most important gap of all was that not everybody was able to access the loans. Um, if you're not a member of the cooperative, then you cannot access the loans. And this is something that Michael will pick up more extensively in his presentation. Um, so that was it for me, just to set the scene and uh, tell you a bit about the climate change impacts and the farmer's response to those. Um, so thank you very much. And the final slide is just some of the references I've used. Karen, great. Thanks ever so much for kind of like overview of um, some of those critical issues that that the that you are facing in terms of um, the the project and and planning activity going forward and on almost a sense that feels like uh, how microfinance perhaps be a, a lifeline for 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 many. Um, uh, farmers, particularly the poorest uh, people. So, with with that, um, I would like to hand over to to Michael, who will be able to speak a little bit more about some of those um, societal um, inequalities. So, Michael, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Tessie. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Mikulevich. I'm a research fellow, like Tessie mentioned, uh, at the Center for Climate Justice. And um, as Karen mentioned, I'm going to delve a little bit more into the uh, so social, socioeconomic, political implications of, of microfinance and how it actually uh, uh, works, at the, works at the local level. So I frame my presentation in terms of this question, can microfinance help achieve climate justice? Um, see. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to uh, briefly provide you uh, with an overview of the critical tensions that we have identified in the literature between microfinance and climate justice, and also I'm going to contextualize microfinance within Rwanda uh, and talk a little bit about why it's so popular uh, at the moment. Um, and then the main part of the presentation will be on the challenges for inclusive development that we have identified in this context, followed by conclusions and uh, some future research needs that we, we identified. Uh, so in order to, uh, to kind of look at this relationship between climate justice and microfinance, we, we wanted to go beyond the, the usual uh, you know, uh, analysis of how microfinance may or may not affect uh, farmers choices or increase or decrease your productivity uh, we we wanted to do that and we obviously did but we also wanted to go a little bit further and see what kind of societal implications that reliance on microfinance can actually have at the local level in rural, rural rwanda uh, and that is obviously in the broader context of adaptation to climate change so this is this is the the general framing is within obviously adaptation rather than mitigation and the critical tensions that I mentioned uh, a minute ago uh, are uh, quite a quite few, uh, quite quite numerous, I would say, in the in the in the literature. Uh, for one, um, some some critics mention that you know a reliance on microfinance can lead to long-term maladaptation if it creates a, a vicious cycle of indebtedness, and that might not be uh, the case for Rwanda as much as it is in India or Bangladesh because microfinance institutions are, are very heavily regulated, uh, relatively 
heavily regulated in Rwanda compared to uh, to uh, uh, India or Bangladesh. Um, one of the main critiques is that microfinance usually benefits economically active households. So those who live on the poverty line or just below it. So it does not really address uh, the needs of, of the destitute, of the, of the very poorest groups uh, in society, because uh, for microfinance uh, institutions, very often uh, those individuals, those groups are not seen as uh, reliable enough uh, uh, to, to provide even a microloan. Uh, some others mentioned that microfinance is not transformative in the sense that it, it does help farmers uh, uh, kind of to, uh, it, it carries them over to the next season if there's some kind of adversity, for example, a drought or, or, or a flood or flash flood. Um, but it contributes to the survival economy of, of households, but doesn't really transform the, the economics of, uh, and, and the, the socio political, let's say. Uh, circumstance of, of a given household. On, on the other hand, uh, climate justice scholars like, like myself, like my colleagues, uh, argue that climate justice uh, as a goal will only be achieved through systemic measures as opposed to, uh, to the, the, the minor economic ones uh, of which microfinance is seen as, uh, as, as part. So that the mo mo most ardent critics of microfinance go as far as describing it as an arm of neoliberalism. Uh, so a way to open up the markets to, to more penetration. Uh, and these uh, you know, uh, areas that you see in the picture, for example, uh, market penetration isn't as high, obviously, as, as in certain other parts of the world yet. Uh, and then Kasia Poprotsky uh, also mentions in her uh, studies the implications for negative implications of microfinance on gender inequality, so, uh, or gender equality, I should say. Uh, for example, there have been uh, studies showing that uh, the, the, the uh, funds received by women through microfinance schemes uh, end up in the hands of, in, in the hands of, for example, their husbands or male family members in any case. Uh, and so the financial inclusion argument for, for women in that case, it does not hold. So just to provide you a little bit, uh, very briefly, a little bit of context about microfinance in Rwanda, uh, the reason why we're talking about this is because microfinance is very, very popular in, in rural Rwanda. And it's uh, and not just rural, urban as well. Uh, and that's an effect of long-term government policy to promote uh, microfinance through cooperatives and savings groups, which actually are able to access that those funds through microfinance institutions. Um, and that is uh, that, can, that can be kind of uh, put against the, broad, the bigger backdrop of growing market penetration, like I said, in rural Rwanda. Uh, so here we're talking about market liberalization and responsabilization, where where you're expecting farmers or or you know the poorer segments of society to uh, to invest in productive activities to uh, pull themselves out of poverty. Uh, so that's the kind of um, um, displacement of, of responsibility for fighting for poverty from the government or development agencies onto onto individuals themselves. And that's that's the broad argument of the critics of microfinance in this case. And in, in contrast to this, during our interviews, we did not see much uh, uh, focus, or actually, not once was uh, you know government assistance, direct government assistance, mentioned uh, as a potential way to to decrease uh, farmers' vulnerability. There's uh, the thinking in microfinance or or local productivity, local uh, marketization uh, terms is very strong in rural Rwanda, um, from what we could tell. Uh, so that also explains why. Uh, uh, why microfinance is actually so uh, so popular in the in the country, and the Rwanda Cooperative Agency there in the in the on the left is the uh, the government agency that actually uh, is supposed to regulate uh, microfinance institutions. So moving on to the main main point of the presentation, the challenges for inclusive development and adaptation that we've managed. So let's start with the observation that is we believe valid, uh, which is that cooperatives and and savings groups act as a safety net for their members. And that is something that uh, uh, we found very heavy, uh, very difficult to debate because that's exactly what the uh, participants were telling us. For example, uh, uh, one of the employees at Eurego Bank mentioned that, uh, you know, when a farmer fails to pay back their loan, uh, the group has a social grant and then the, the bank takes repayment from that social grant. And if that loan is higher than whatever is, uh, you know, saved, 
uh, say that in that grant, the other group members must pay back the loan to the farmer. And usually they don't fail, uh, fail to pay the, those loans back because they want loans for the next season. So there's a safety net, a financial safety net here for the members where, whereby if something happens to you uh, and, and you don't have enough uh, production or you don't have enough income to repay the loan, you can count on your group members to kind of step in and, and cover that for you. You will have to repay that later, but nevertheless, that is a safety net that non-members cannot enjoy. Which leads me to the buts. So in our critical analysis of, of the data, we noticed uh, concerns related to social mobility and related concerns to social stratification, which is what I'm going to uh, to discuss a little bit uh, in greater detail now. With regards to uh, social mobility, um, it was evident that, that for most farmers, uh, unless they're extremely productive, extremely uh, wealthy, it is impossible to obtain a loan without membership in a cooperative and, and uh, or a Village Savings and Loans Association, like, like Karen mentioned. Um, at the same time, however, it is not easy to become a member, and there are different barriers that we have identified uh, in this context. First, we've got the financial barriers. So as part of a cooperative or, um, or the, the savings group, uh, you've got fees uh, that you have to pay every month. And in addition to that, in the case of cooperatives, you also have to buy out shares. And how many shares you buy determines what kind of plot of land you get. Uh, what is uh, tricky here is that land prices have been growing. And uh, I've got my cheat sheet here. Uh, according to one interview in 2007, uh, one plot, uh, uh, one rice paddy plot was 20,000 London francs. That's 20, 2007. Uh, 12 years later, in 2019, that same plot, that plot will cost 105,000 rand and francs. So adjusted for inflation, that's a threefold increase in the in land prices. So we can see the, the, the challenges, financial challenges there is becoming less and less affordable to become a member. There's also technical barriers, like Karen mentioned. Uh, your regular bank provides technical assistance to, to the members. Uh, that ranges from agricultural uh, sustainable agricultural practices to grant management to uh, sometimes even uh, you know religious support so there's a lot of uh, technical capacity support that is being provided to members uh, as a non-member here mentions only the cooperative receives support and training from Urego for us we are not supported at all some of the cooperative members whose rice parcels are adjacent to our parcels do show us some techniques and advise us on which pesticides to use so you can see that there's a, a, an exchange a knowledge exchange happening at the local level, but only informally, um, and there's no guarantee that that, uh, that advice will be correct. Uh, so you can see a growing disparity here in the in the sense of the technical capacities of different farmers. And then you've got sociocultural and political barriers. That's that's how kind of we frame that a very catch-all term. Um, here we've got a distrust towards lenders in general. People don't want to uh, uh, rely on on credit uh, for various reasons. Uh, at the same time, there's poor community cohesion, so people don't really want to uh, be liable for repaying the loans of, of their neighbors, if they, if they, which they sometimes perceive as unfair. And, and finally, there's not enough land. So in the case of the cooperative that we uh, we investigated, there aren't any parcels left. So uh, so if you just want to uh, if you want to become a member, you will have to buy those parcels, the right to those parcels from from others, which obviously. Uh, complicates access. So related to those social mobility concerns, we've got social stratification. And here we, we observe uh, huge inequalities, I would say, between uh, plot sizes already existing between uh, cooperative members. Uh, so some members uh, own only 16 acres, uh, whereby others um, you know, have plots as big as 56 acres. And obviously, if you if you consider non-members, that is uh, a zero to 56 acre range. Uh, those farmers who do have sizable plots, um, they have to, and they have access to microfinance uh, by definition. They also have to uh, uh, co-op labor uh, to realize profit, obviously. So, um, so they rely on laborers, agricultural laborers, and in some cases, it's as many as 65 people and, uh, and engaged in. Uh, in uh, agricultural labor in those plots at different times of the year. Uh, so these laborers uh, uh, agree to do so uh, 
for two main reasons. One, uh, because they've, they're already done with their small plots, usually the hillside plots that Kevin mentioned, like, uh, like the ones uh, here in the picture. And they have a time that they can spend working in the more productive farmers fields. Or more problematically, they don't uh, have enough money, they cannot afford agriculture inputs for their own fields, even if, if their fields are sizable. Uh, so like Karen mentioned, uh, it's very important in some cases to rely on pesticides or, or sorry, fertilizers. If you don't have access to that, then, then your production will be uh, lower and you might have to resort to selling your labor instead. At the same time, uh, we've got the uh, phenomenon of renting out or selling land by less productive farmers. And one of the uh, members of the uh, savings groups in uh, uh, Rubeville uh, mentioned that uh, he bought uh, that uh, one of his plots from a neighboring farmer uh, because he thought uh, they had financial problems that required money. So that's what actually they did. They, they sold their land um, uh, to their neighbor. So the so these different processes and uh, reliance on agricultural labor, the progressing dependency, income disparity, uh, results in in land consolidation in in the districts that we have uh, visited and the consequent social certification. Uh, so you've got farmers who are doing very well with microfinance support, but also you've got on the other hand farmers who cannot benefit from that, uh, from, from, from that support and, and their uh, uh, prospects for increased productivity are much dimmer. And, and this is, uh, this is uh, something that is happening even without climate change, but you, if, when you add climate change to the picture, it, it becomes even more complicated. Uh, so as one of uh, our uh, interviewees said, laborers, those casual laborers, are the first to be affected when a climate disaster strikes. Um, if there is no work in the marshland, they will migrate. The parcels owners will then do the farming activities by themselves, saving some, themselves some money. Uh, the casual laborers in this marshland are the first people who will migrate whenever there is a climate and weather change issue. So we predict that this will lead to increased frequency and, and intensity of climate impacts will lead to uh, more instances of selling land or renting out land to, to the more productive households, as well as to migration to, to more, most likely urban centers or to uh, other rural areas that don't uh, suffer as much from climate impacts. We also predict that the, the argument proposed by certain uh, certain development practitioners that share the wealth will be shared locally, it will not take place. Uh, that will, uh, there is no indication, at least right now, from what we've seen that the wealthier households will start sharing their wealth uh, with those who cannot make the ends meet. Um, and that led us to the conclusion that agricultural labor, which is a, an adaptive strategy uh, for those who cannot, uh, Man and do not manage to uh, to secure a sizable yield is not a viable adaptation strategy in the long term because precisely because of this precisely because when a climate disaster strikes those laborers will be the first to go uh, in to put in put it in blatant terms so in terms of the conclusions for climate justice um, we recognize that microfinance is key for increasing productivity levels and those incomes but for group members for for savings group members and for cooperative members. However, it does not increase wealth uh, for the most vulnerable because simply because they are excluded from the entire uh, scheme. So this is problematic because of the growing income disparity, not so much because uh, incomes will go uh, down or not only because incomes will go, go down among the, uh, the poorest, but also because they will go exponentially up uh, to uh, in the case of those who actually can benefit from microfinance and can invest in fertilizers, seeds, uh, labor, and so forth. So in terms of, uh, that's my final slide, in terms of the future climate needs, uh, sorry, research needs, I think we have a lot of climate needs as well, but uh, just limiting our discussion to research needs. Uh, we can uh, ascertain at this point that in its current form at least, microfinance is not the answer for the poorest and most marginalized rural classes in Rwanda. It might be for the productive households, uh, even within the poor group, uh, but not for the destitute and not for the excluded, for the marginalized. So that has to be recognized openly by those, by proponents and, and, and critics of microfinance uh, at the same time. So we need, we need to find ways to level the playing field in the, in the Rwandan countryside and in, in the countryside in general. 
and not just in Rwanda, for non-members, especially for, for the youth, uh, because as, as I mentioned, because of that deficit of land, young people are having increased uh, increasing difficulty uh, accessing cooperatives and saving groups and, and securing land. Uh, so that has to also be taken into consideration. And more theoretically, more of the research uh, level, there is more empirical and conceptual uh, investigation, uh, I would say, needed to establish that relationship between, uh, between adaptation microfinance and climate justice. And, and we were very happy to see that Opportunity International uh, actually uh, uh, took up the uh, recommendations we, we delivered as part of this project. And, and we will be looking into these uh, inequality aspects uh, in the next project with OI, which Pete will, will shortly discuss in greater detail. But that is all from me. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward uh, to your questions. Michael, thank you very much for that in-depth um, uh, an insight into this, you know the reality of the, of the situation. And I think one of the striking things that has come from your very last slide when you say microfinance in its current form, so it's as if it's not a, a good uh, you know strategy for um, uh, supporting the poorest people, but in its current form, it, do it doesn't actually work. And I guess it's that that mantra about it, injustice issues. Is I guess it's the you know the, those that have contributed least to to climate change that are suffering the most, but they're obviously not yeah. able to get access to um, the resource and um, the financial support that's needed the most. And I guess with, with those kind of like perspectives, I guess now it's opportune to hear from uh, Pete who. We'll talk about how the, he, the Opportunity International have taken stock of um, where we are at with the project and to give us some insights as to the next steps going forward. So um, welcome, Pete. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hussein, and a warm, warm greetings to all the 32 participants. That's really encouraging who have actually stuck around for this super interesting presentation from my friends and colleagues at GCU. And, and here again, although, I mean, I was their counterpart during uh, the study, and I've, I've seen it, you know, uh, being born, being carried out, and then a little, you know, subsequent versions of the report. It is always amazing for me to see the depth and the level they managed to go to with what essentially was a pilot project. So again, kudos, kudos to the research team. And I think that there's a lot uh, of courageous, brave information there because, I mean, we've exposed, they have exposed some uh, tensions and contradictions, which we, we know we were there, but it's very nice to have an academic uh, sort of point of view on that. My presentation will be uh, a lot shallower, if I may say so, and we will uh, look at this from inside the microfinance uh, world. My name is Pete Parizetti. I serve as a program manager uh, for Opportunity International UK, and I'm in charge of a 1.2 million pound uh, microfinance project in Western and Southern Rwanda. And Opportunity International, who may not be known to everybody in the group, uh, is, a, is a relatively complicated animal to describe. I, I, I use the word constellation of actors <laughs> to say that is a really, I mean, is a grouping of different, uh, uh, of different actors. You have a network of uh, national organizations like OIUK, in essentially in countries of the north of the world, in donor countries. And this organization exists to channel resources and knowledge to another class of members of the Opportunity Constellation, uh, which are active microfinance actors, essentially banks in the south of the world, banks which we used to own ourselves, and then they were divested a few years ago, but they remain very close uh, partners, operational partners for uh, for. for for Opportunity International. Now, as I say, uh, looking at this from a, from a more general point of view and, and looking ahead, and I don't, I have to click this. Next slide, will you go? Yes, sorry, back here. We are aware of 
considerable untapped potential and in uh, opportunity international parlance we define microfinance of, as the provision of formal and affordable financial services to the working poor and this has saved all the tensions that michael was talking about and we know that this has grown in the last three decades to become a service delivery platform with an enormous outreach. We're looking at today about 600 million people, 140 million individual clients, their families and, and the people who work for, uh, for them. And these are essentially in developing countries. We also know that the scale of the sector and the nature of, of the delivery model we employ, which provides frequent high touch support to individual households, suggest there is a high potential for microfinance to promote low carbon development and greater resilience for up to 140 million households in developing countries who we know are often the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. High touch is a bit of a buzzword uh, of, of, the, of the microfinance world. It means that the individual clients interact a lot with the loan officers. There's a personal relationship and critically, as it was briefly mentioned before, the provision of financial services and in particular of loans is always accompanied by a wide range of trainings. Uh, there's, there's, for instance, uh, training in better agricultural practices, there's training in entrepreneurship for uh, saving groups, there's training in holistic, holistic uh, life skills improvement, and our own evaluations say that that is valued at least as much as the actual provision of either savings or, uh, or loans. So, great scale, high potential. However, a, a review of the relatively scant literature available suggests that this potential remains largely unexplored, owing to a, a lack of awareness among the stakeholders. And here I'm talking about funders because there are not many, but there are sources of capital who are, who are interested in the subject of climate change and adaptation, but who do not know that they, this uh, resources can be channeled through microfinance institutions. The service providers, they don't know, it's our own experience with our partners that they are not really aware. And others, and others, very importantly include the clients themselves. The clients don't know, they're, they're aware of the consequences of climate change, but they don't know necessarily that microfinance can be a tool to you know, lessen the impacts. And B, there's a lack of capital. The, the sources of funding I was talking about are really few and far between. Then critically, the MFIs themselves are exposed to climate risks that threaten their own organizational sustainability. Uh, look at what happened with COVID-19. That's not an an, 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 a climate change thing, but that's an example of a risk, which uh, a, a, an outside risk that may have a dramatic impact on, on the capacity of the institutions to work and, 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 and provide their services to function and to some extent to exist. Moving forward, we're proposing a new research project in partnership with GCU and also critically with the University of Rwanda, which will take a, a, a really a, a forefront uh, role. And this is the natural extension, as Michael said, of the work that's been carried out in 2019. We will begin by looking in greater depth our at our partner in Rwanda, this Uruguay Bank that you've heard mentioned. And uh, remember Uruguay, which means ladder in Kenya, Rwanda. I find that very cute, uh, a ladder that you climb up to lift yourself up of, of, uh, out of poverty. Uh, Uruguay is a relatively big fish in Rwanda and in, in the financial sector, having about 10% of the market in the country. And the idea is to appraise their existing financial services and mitigation adaptation policies and programs to identify new opportunities to improve climate resilience among the communities they serve 
And then this is not an inward looking uh, initiative. We aim to share lessons learned with the rest of the sector. Very importantly, however, this is not only about learning things because uh, this we call this applied research or operational research. Hopefully this would be the first step in building up a portfolio of program options and possibly what we consider specialized tailored financial products. And I will explain in a moment what I'm talking about. Now, the rationale for this project rests on three pillars, which I briefly mentioned already. Let me stress again. There's need, the incidence of climate change impacts and the limitations in available funding and support suggest enormous needs in developing countries, especially among, amongst women, low income households, rural and agriculture dependent communities. And I think that what Michael and, and, um, and Karin just told us, I mean, it's crystal clear. There's need, but there's there's also opportunity, not only as opportunity international, but the, the opportunity, because as we said in the beginning, the scale of the microfinance sector, the fact that it's focused on vulnerable groups in what we explained as high touch delivery model, makes it so that it could play a significant role in promoting climate resilience. The challenge is that to play a greater role in supporting climate resilience, microfinance providers need a clearer understanding themselves of the needs, the opportunity, including whatever is available in terms of finance and the role they can play. As I said already, there's also a need to better understand and manage the MFI's own organizational risks resulting from climate change. This as I said, is not for our own benefit or for just an academic uh, curiosity. This is an initiative aiming at learning, but also sharing. We're looking at a two year project, potentially with an extension into a third year, to develop a knowledge, a knowledge base on how the microfinance sector can contribute to climate resilience, to learn from the fragmented work that's been done uh, in the sector at the present, and crucially to clarify what contributes most to building climate resilience and alleviating poverty. And here I would like to stop for a second, because building climate resilience and alleviating poverty are the same thing. I believe that there's a consensus now, as it has been uh, with, the, for instance, disaster risk reduction, that you cannot do sustainable development without doing climate uh, resilience and adaptation. If you do climate resilience adaptation, you do sustainable development and you cannot do sustainable development without dealing with climate issues in the world we live in. So that's those three points sort of capture this big size, the main, main, main thrust philosophy. Then there's the need of, as already said to raise awareness amongst service providers and funders of the climate adaptation potential of the microfinance platform and the role MFIs can play in this respect at the community and household level. And finally, and here again, assist MFIs in identifying, reporting and reducing their own risks. Finally, last slide and in practice. At the end of this work, we hopefully will have a toolkit and a set of guidance for MFIs to help them assess the specific vulnerabilities and the needs the community or of the communities they serve. They don't do this. Very few do it, and those who do it, do it at a very superficial level. They have to go a lot more in depth if we want to pursue that philosophy of mainstreaming, integrating, making climate change adaptation integral to sustainable development. We want to help them identify program opportunities that could meet those needs. And here I come with the, come back to the idea of specialized financial products. And this is a, a bit of a trademark of Opportunity Interna International because in, in working with our 
and microfinance partners over the years, we have developed a series of, how could I say, yeah, really specialized tailored products. There are ag agri finance, agricultural finance products. There are edu finance, education supporting affordable private education. There are uh, uh, financial products supporting water sanitation and hygiene promotions. There are other financial products specialized for uh, youth programming. So why not thinking of some uh, program slash really financial product that targets particularly um, climate adaptation and ideally in a really ideal world, perhaps taking into account the justice issues that, uh, that Michael has so eloquently outlined. There's this, I would call the, the uh, tactical, tactical level. This is what you do next month or next year. But MFIs have to make strategic decisions as well because we live in a climate change, uh, climate change world. They operate in a ch climate change world. So they have to adapt, change their strategy and policies to take that into account. Hopefully, with our toolkit and guidance, MFIs will become aware of climate, um, climate funders, funders with uh, an interest in climate uh, issues so that they can uh, access capital and sources of funding. Or importantly, and this is something I've not mentioned, but again, from the, the pilot research that has been just presented to us and saving all the, the tensions and the contradictions, it is, however, apparent that existing firms are to some extent climate smart. They do some, to some extent have an impact on adaptation and resilience. Why not, uh, on top of developing potentially new, uh, new products and services, why not uh, making the existing programs and services more effective in tackling climate issues. And finally, and I repeat this for the last time, institutions must be helped and supported in assessing the, the risks to themselves. With that, I conclude. I'm happy, I'll be happy to participate in the Q&A session afterward. Pete, great. Thanks very much for providing that, that sense of clarity and pulling together um, the idea behind the, the new project, taking stock of um, you know, what we've already learned. Um, I'm talking to a blank screen, so I'm just waiting. Oh, that's climate it. Finance. Yeah, issues okay. of climate finance are critical. Um, and we all also know that um, the poorest and the most vulnerable don't have access to financial resources as much as we'd like them to. So having a project of this nature in a, in a way, kind of like plugging that gap, I think is, is absolutely vital um, at this point. Um, I think with that, what I would like to do is hand over to Clemmy um, to see if we can address some of the questions that are in in the chat box um and while we're while we're arranging that um you can see um clemmy who's there she she was formerly working at the unis center when she she did the project with us she's now at the university of strathclyde um we've got karen we've got pete hopefully we've got patrick somewhere oh, okay. um Okay, so hand over to you, Clemmy, to, to handle um, some of the questions that are coming through. Here we are. Here, there's Pete and hopefully Karen and yeah, Ella. Hi. Karen, can you turn your camera on? Me? Yeah. My camera's on. Is, uh, is Ella and Patrick joining us on video? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Here's Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay, Clemmy, over to you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, great. Thanks very much um, to the folk who have already um, asked some questions, and please do keep them uh, keep them coming in. Um, we'll start with um, a couple, and then we'll move over to um, 
to zine. Um, so we've got one from um, Joshua Williams. Um, and he asked, I think this was in relation to something that you mentioned, um, Michael, and that was about the social grant. Um, I'm wondering where the social grant came from. Um, sorry, social grant. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, okay. So the social, the way I understand it uh, is that every uh, cooperative or uh, saving group is uh, expected to maintain a, like a, a safety net <laughs> funding kind of uh, grant so that exactly when that this kind of thing happens um, they can they can kind of, kind of spend that on repaying the loan of the farmer that has defaulted uh, so that kind of increases the the, the likelihood that you know, of, of taking the loan because there's less risk for those who, who do so, uh, where, whereby other members of the group actually, like I mentioned, step in. Uh, so this is this is internal funding of the group. It's not provided by anybody else. It's just people pulling together their resources, which are the points of, of VSLAs and co-ops. Um, so yeah, so that's it, it's internal funding by the group. Great, thanks for that, um, Michael. Um, and then another question um, comes from Rahima, um, and they ask about provision for micro, uh, for migrants. So whether there's any sort of finance that is specifically available for migrants. I don't know who feels best able to um, answer that question. Yeah, I wonder, Patrick, do, are you aware of any any support for migrants? We didn't really look into that aspect at all. We just uh, migrants were only uh, mentioned in passing by the interviewees. Uh, but yeah, so I wouldn't be able to speak to that. So maybe Patrick, are you aware of any uh, any support here? Uh, Michael, for, for here, there's Patrick. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm around. So um, for, for the question of migrants, uh, I don't know if there is any specific provision for them as uh, uh, what, what I'm aware of uh, uh, is that uh, in, in that specific area, uh, there were people who, like who migrated, but most of the programs that targets migrants uh, targets them in those uh, government uh, created areas. So, and I basically think uh, that one is not among uh, uh, government created areas for migrants. So I don't know if there is any specific um, provision for them as they are not in those specific areas. Okay, and Pete, did you have something that you wanted to add there as well? No, it was just that, that because I mean, I'm not a, really, I'm not a, an expert, but I think that in the particular Rwandan context, uh, migration is not necessarily a big issue, and uh, also is a, is a country that has uh, problems on its own already with the population density and the scarcity of land, and it would be difficult to see uh, how it could be attractive for uh, for migrants. Which I'm not intending that migration does not happen. But I personally don't see it as a major issue in the particular Rwanda context. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for that, um, Pete. Uh, Tazine, do you want to take the next couple of questions? Yeah, there's another couple of questions. So please do keep interesting chats coming through. So we have a question from Matthews, and this is directed to Karen. If you could possibly explain what kind of agricultural training that the Urego Bank is giving to farmers. Um, if you could perhaps expand on, on that. And then we have a, another question to, to Michael. So do you, want, do you want to take that one, Karen, for now? Yeah, sure. Um, the things that were mentioned that were, you know, what seeds to use, when to plant, what fertilizers to apply, what pesticides to apply. Um, one of the things that came up a few times is, is if you plant early, then it, you're more likely to get a successful crop. So like I said, there's an element of, of kind of good farm management. Um, I quite agree with you, Matthew, that um, it, I've, my background is um, in environmental quality and water quality in particular. So the emphasis that people were placing on increasing fertilizer and increasing pesticides um, is a little bit worrying. Uh, pesticides in particular, you know, they have the capacity to get into the groundwater. People 
take their groundwater, you know, that's, that's a drinking water resource. Um, so if you see an increase of that, that can expose the entire population to these micropollutants. Um, and in addition, there's a direct exposure impact as well when people spray pesticides or however they apply them without you know, proper um, protective equipment. So there's quite a lot that we haven't really explored yet. And I think those vulnerabilities um, to these kind of environmental concerns um, is something that we could explore in the next project. Um, for example, you know, excess nitrates in the drinking water is a health risk as well. Um, so yeah, we, we hope to address that. In the Thanks, Karen, for that. And also from from Matthew is a, is a question for for Michael um, a, a, about your conclusions, really, um, and how generalizable you think um, they, they they are um, to the, to a global context. Do you want to chime? Yeah, um, sure. So, to to the extent to which this could work elsewhere is yeah how I understand this question. It's really hard to say, but I, I have not seen in my literature review examples of microfinance products uh, directed at the poorest uh, simply because uh, of the issues that I, I mentioned, uh, the, the low kind of uh, uh, credibility that they, they present to lenders uh, through their low incomes and, and lack of collateral, for example. Uh, so I'm not sure if it would uh, work better elsewhere. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, a, an absolute expert in microfinance uh, by any means, uh, uh, but maybe my colleagues know of any, any products that actually are uh, geared towards the poor. I think in Rwanda, uh, based on our conversations with our partners and interviewees, um, it, it is not possible to take a loan to cover another loan. Uh, which is not the case in India or Bangladesh, to my understanding. So that kind of gets, uh, kind of uh, diminishes the uh, possibility of creating that that cycle of indebtedness. Uh, so we've got more regulation and definitely uh, there's less fallout uh, in that sense. We had a, a project, uh, we proposed, we had proposed a project to a funder a while back about uh, about specifically microfinance uh, products targeted to poor rural youth in, in Rwanda. And I think that that was seen as something too risky even for our research pilot. Uh, so, uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, resistance on the part of the sector uh, to actually open the door to the poorest. Uh, and you, know, you, you can't really blame them if they are a, a business venture. Uh, they cannot open themselves to people who, in, in many cases, will probably default on those loans, um, you know, deliberately or not. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so it's hard to say how, how, how generali generalizable all this is, but I still have to see a microfinance product directed specifically on the poorest segments of the population that works. But thanks, Michael, for that. I'm just before I go on to the question from Sam, I just wonder is there, is there any other members of the team that would like to to add to what Michael has already said about how generalizable the the findings are? Um, if does anyone else want to come in on on that just now? No. Okay. So I'll just quickly go on to the question for from, from Sam. Oh, sorry, Pete. Go ahead. Yes, I'm not a member of the team, of the academic team, but uh, I think that. In a way, the, the results as they were presented by Michael could be slightly misleading because of the very particular nature of Rwanda, uh, the way the land ownership uh, structure in Rwanda is particular and the strong emphasis from the Rwandan government in terms of, you know, dicta almost, uh, you know, uh, in position from above that agriculture has to be through cooperatives creates distortions which are particular peculiar to the Rwandan context and the difficulty for the non-members to become members of the cooperative creates a lot of the tensions and the difficulties. I believe that in the case of saving groups in Rwanda and elsewhere the access the entry points uh, are a lot easier. And, and we know that saving groups begin, begin with savings and then move to loans. 
and then they move, in, move to insurance, and then at the most they reach the level of social security. And I personally, without being an expert, but having read about, uh, read around a little bit, I seem to see saving groups as a, a more democratic, a more open, a more accessible form of collective, uh, collective access to financial services. Thanks, Pete. And I guess the next question from Sam Vickersteth may relate to what you've already said there. Um, but, and the question is, do, do, is there a view on what a financial product um, that is responsive to adaptation, what would that, would that look like? And, and would it change seasonal loans provision, for example, or instead focus on more multi-annual longer term loans. So if I could direct that at you, Pete, to start with, and then perhaps others could come in and provide their thoughts on, on that point. That's putting me on the spot, first of all, because Sam is, my <laughs> Sam is the CEO of a Fortune <laughs> UK. And because I'm, I'm a humble program manager, I'm not an expert either in finance uh, nor in, in climate change adaptation. However, looking at in the, really with the practitioners i if i look at what happens uh, with uh, with uh, schools for instance education finance and the principal has uh, a, a, a set of interventions in mind renovating building a new classroom renovating uh, repainting or buying desks or doing things that will make his uh, his school work better and you can access specialized products for that with the idea that then the, 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 we work with what we call affordable private schools, uh, it, there will be a financial return which will uh, allow the principal to pay back the loan. Uh, is it not thinkable that there are interventions in, uh, in climate ad adaptation, water management, for instance, or other things, and or, or a crop selection, really, I mean, I'm out of my, of my, my area of expertise here, but I think, uh, looking into this with the experts, that interventions could be identified uh, that people would ask money for, and this is not to buy fertilizers and pesticides, this is to better manage climate impact, which in return will end up in them being more resilient and, and more more affluent and be able to pay back to pay back the loan. I'm fantasizing completely here, but I think that there is scope to um, there is scope to investigate. Thanks, Pete, for that. I'd like to just bring in other members of, of the project team. Patrick, um, Ella, Clemmy, do you like to give some thoughts on what a product product will look like? And I guess perhaps we're jumping a little bit off the gun because you know that perhaps might come towards the end of once we've done the second project but just your insights would be quite helpful just now i think one of the things that i found um interesting um about some of the well most of the interviews actually cited the good practice of uego that they do do the seasonal loans and i was quite surprised that that was um quite specific to Uego when it's it's quite a simple way of um, kind of making things a bit more manageable um, for for the farmers. So um, I think actually getting the insights from from the farmers themselves of what would be the most kind of, um, you know, what fits in with their day to day um, lives and what what kind of fits in with the needs that they have and, and hopefully this next project that the that the team are embarking on will will start to kind of shed a bit of light on what some of those possibilities might be. Yeah thanks. Also interesting to mention again that uh, some farmers uh, specifically said that um, an insurance project a uh, product like a crop insurance in case of adverse weather so that is maybe something so this is a different kind of financial product altogether so i don't know if that's something that um for regal bank or other providers um would be able to respond to um in terms of agricultural adaptations there are um if you look at the you know, the government of rwanda's um suggestions on how to adapt to climate change they also have um Things like um, planting more trees, for example, um, and in the 
some of the literature, um, tree planting uh, has worked, like they've, they've indicated that tree planting has worked really well, almost as a kind of savings facility. You plant trees and, you know, after a long, you, you cut them down when you need the money, but it's, it's quite a long term investment, but it, it seems to have worked quite well uh, for the people who've been able to afford it. So if you maybe combine adaptations like those with a microfinance project that can help you access those kinds of adaptations, then maybe that's something that might work. But I mean, like I say, we're really just speculating on some of these issues that will need more research to see whether that's feasible and whether it makes sense. Thanks, Kat. Do you want to come in and say something? I could, yeah, I could just say a few things. I mean, the literature has their suggestions on what these sort of products would look like. And as Karen's saying, that's where the research side needs to come in and look further and see, well, are these feasible? Do they work? And some of the suggestions in the literature have to do with either climate proofing existing products. So that might be what Pete was mentioning, where we make sliding co-payments, where we allow flexibility in repayments. Or it might be climate proofing the products in the way that we put conditionalities on. Uh, so if we wanted to make it adaptable, then we would say, well, OK, you can only use it for certain types of seeds that are um, that are going to be climate resistant or in certain types of products. So that's one way the literature suggests. And then, of course, brand new products, as someone else was bringing up, micro insurance schemes or crop insurance schemes, livestock insurance schemes are things that are, farmers have asked for. So these would be new products that microfinance could mm -hmm. consider investing in. So there is a, quite a few ideas the literature suggests on what to do and now I guess it's for future research and microfinance institutions to see how to go about this and if it's feasible. Great, yeah. thanks ever so much Ella. I'm just conscious of the time, we've got another couple of questions coming in so Clemmie do you want to take the next, next um, um, set of questions? Yes, yeah, so we've got um, a question from David who initially said it's a very insightful presentation so thanks for that everyone um, and the question is would it be fair to say that microfinance doesn't always reach those who need it um, and help adapt because of the kind of wider financial sector and that it's not structured with that adaptation objective in mind um, so he's used an example here so microfinance might improve productivity in like the current climate as it is um, and it helps farmers pay off their loans but if loans are used to adapt to extreme weather it might maintain some level of productivity but it wouldn't necessarily lead to kind of more income it would kind of plateau and um, so a kind of a bit of a trade-off there I suppose um, and whether or not that's kind of one of the the issues with microfinance as it as it stands I suppose that's one of the reasons why we're doing this next piece of research or you guys are doing the next piece of research that says that starts to look at what how you might change some of that financial structure um to support adaptation better i don't know whether there's um there's any kind of additional things there that we've not already said yeah um, um <laughs> yeah go on for it Cool. Yeah, because I think I think it's 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 a very good question because I fear that we might be slowly moving in some places at least from a paradigm where microfinance is supposed to increase incomes to a, a paradigm where microfinance could help at least preserve impacts. Uh, sorry, preserve incomes because of climate change, um, and and that that poses very important questions for the industry. Um, what kind of help can be provided? What kind of uh, uh, you know, um, products can be offered through micro microloans and so forth. And also it opens up uh, another question that a lot of critical development uh, geographers like myself has, have uh, struggled with. What does adaptation actually mean? So what, what solutions count as adaptation? Because as Pete mentioned, it may not have to be a fertilizer or, or a new kind of, you know, uh, kind of seed, but it might be uh, ensuring uh, that people can send their children to to, to school, uh, for example, that can be considered an adaptation, a very long term adaptation, long term investment. But obviously, how that impacts the financial sustainability of the sector is something that probably Pete could could um, discuss in greater detail. But I think we are in a changing paradigm where where the old ways of doing things might not be uh, might not be sustainable anymore. And we have heard from participants saying. Uh, when we were kind of we were 
prodding them to say, okay, so if somebody defaults on a load, if one person defaults on a load, what happens? Well, then, then the group steps in. What about five people? Well, probably the group will cover those two. And I said, well, where, what if there's a climate calamity and everybody uh, defaults on their loads? And they said, well, that never happened before. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It might happen in the future. And the question is, do we have contingency plans for that? So that's more of a, an answer than a question, uh, question and answer. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think there's clearly lots of um, lots of challenges, and it it looks like from uh, the kind of comments here that people are going to be really interested in what happens in the next phase of research, because um, that hopefully will begin to kind of answer some of these uh, some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so another question here. Um, so uh, Christian asks whether Uwego can potentially extend their loan products to horticultural farmers, um, as they are currently quite um, greatly affected by climate change in rural Rwanda. So I don't know whether that's um, something that's already happening or could happen in the future. Uh, as far as I know, let's put it this way, I don't know. <laughs> it's not my I don't know. Because uh, okay. the, the thing is that now I'm, 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 I, don't, I don't remember if uh, horticulturalists are sometimes part of cooperatives. If that is the case, yes, they get loans like anybody else, no problem. Uh, what I don't know, uh, to, to, to be perfectly honest, is Urbego's policy concerning individual clients. I'm sure they do serve individual clients, but I would not be able to, uh, I would not be able to answer that. And we know the distortions of, of the beginnings of microfinance when, you know, individual clients were chased down to the last <laughs> bankruptcy. And, and therefore, I think that, uh, yes, uh, we, we very much like the idea of collective loans to groups, either in cooperatives or, uh, or saving groups. But as I say, I declare my ignorance as to the policies of the bank for individual loans. Great, thanks, thanks, Pete, for that. Yeah, thanks, Clemmy, for that. I'm just uh, looking at, in terms of interest of time, whether we can um, begin to kind of like wrap up. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So I wonder whether Michael, we could get on to the on to the kind of like thanks everyone for taking part in that discussion. I think it was really fruitful, and there's obviously lots and lots still to to share and do. But I'm wondering whether we can move on to the closing slide now. Um, yeah, so as part of this, I want to just to share with everyone that you can now get a, a copy of the final report that was produced um, by the team. It's a fantastic report and it contains a lot of depth and analysis, um, data and insight, and you can get access to that. I think a link will be attached um, to the um, to, I think to the Eventbrite link or um, probably the, um, with the survey that will follow from this, um, yeah. is that right, um, to get some feedback from you on, on the sessions on um, mailing list so you can get access to that. If, you, if you're having difficulty finding the link to that, just reach out to us and we will do what we can um, to, to get, you, get you that link, but please do download it. Um, but what I would also like to do is um, just to, to share with you all that if you have been working um, in this field and would like to share your ideas, certainly, and thoughts um, with the team uh, to broaden and enhance um, the conversation to take place, then please, again, do get in touch. This is um, an evolving matter and there's much um, it's 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 untouched in terms of research and development, and I think there's there's much to explore um, going forward. Um, what I would like to do now is just to say a huge thank you to to you all. Um, most importantly, our audience um, for taking the time to sit in front of a screen. I know there's many. Um, events on at the same time now we're in this new new way, way of working but we really, really appreciate everyone that that listens into the the um the topics and the conversations that that we have laid on um our our public um and also a huge thank you to all of our speakers for taking the the time and energy for putting together those wonderful slides um uh, you know it, it does it's, it's it brings a whole kind of like project uh, to life and also to everyone behind the scenes and making this event happen what i'd just like to do is share with you all um our 
full public engagement calendar. It's now available and you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We have some additional events to the ones that are on this engagement calendar as things are, are, are moving um, pretty fast. Um, so this will be updated as, as we go along. Um, but do follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. And we look forward to welcoming you to our next event, which is not too far away on the 22nd of July. Um, and that's on climate justice and recovery post COVID-19. And we'll be looking at social and racial inequalities. And that, um, that event is run in partnership with um, Chatham House. So we're really excited about, and Semble Scotland, and we're really excited about um, uh, inviting our, our speakers to, to that event. So we've got three minutes to go. Um, so I think we're, we're doing really well in terms of time. I can see that Michael's already put the link up to, to the report. Um, yeah, so again, a huge thank you to, to everyone. And um, we will, if you have any questions to share, you know, we, we are here. Um, and do do connect with us so thank you all again and uh, a very good evening to you all and see you all again soon thanks thank you everyone thanks everyone take care thank you thank you